Thank you, Warren, and good morning, everyone. Um, before I read the text, uh, let me ask you to uh, set a tab at uh, 1 Samuel 15, but we will actually begin our study as an introduction uh, using, using uh, the first seven verses of Psalm 75. I thought it was a wonderful outlay for this uh, introduction into the early part of David's career. So if you'll set a tab, 1 Samuel 15, and then uh, we will look at Psalm 75. Now, we begin this morning, Psalm 75. For the chief musician set to do not destroy. The superscripts we consider to be Holy Scripture. A psalm of Asaph, a song. We give thanks to you, O God. We give thanks for your name is near. People tell of your wondrous works. When I choose a set time, I shall judge righteously. When the earth melts away and all the inhabitants, I keep its pillars firm. So now we are not hearing the psalmist speak. We are hearing directly, uh, in direct discourse, the Lord Himself. I say to the boastful, do not boast. And to the wicked, do not lift up your horn. Do not lift up your horn on high. Do not speak with an arrogant neck. Very interesting, the imagery there. The neck speaking. The neck being the force of communication. It's a figure. Not from the east or west or from the desert mountains. And now specifically as an introduction to our new study. Uh, this fits so well. I am specifically verse 7. But God is judge. He brings one down. He exalts another. This is a poetic picture of the coming of a future judgment. When I think of judgment, you use that word with me in association with God, I think of thunder and lightning, and I think of hail falling and boulders crashing down. But it is not that, according to our psalmist. Judgment is both a blessing and a providence of punishment. We forget the blessing part, but that is specifically what he is doing in verse 7. God is judge. He brings one down. He exalts another. We don't think of exaltation as being a part of God's judgment when we just think about that word. The basic elements to this psalm are the worship praise of our Lord and the trust in His Word and the promise of His judgments. Derek Kidner, the Cambridge scholar, calls the psalm joy with great reversals. We think of Hannah's song, reversals of fortune. We think of Mary's Magnificat, uh, Luke chapter 1. Reversals, all a part of God's judgment. Both examples, exaltation of the humble and judgment upon the proud. Theologically, our psalm here um, emerges, Psalm 75, as a powerful sovereign who rules over all, as well as all the elements of the earth that He created. And He does so by set plans 
establish plans. Decrees, we call them. These plans are implied upon the wicked and upon the humble. He sets the time, the psalmist says. I think of a text like uh, Exodus chapter 9 and verse 16. The Lord saying to Pharaoh through Moses, for this very purpose, did I raise you up that I might show my power and that my name might be great in all the earth? His judgments are all about Him and His glory for both the wicked and for the righteous as well. And parallel to all of the dark judgments upon the wicked, we forget the exaltation of the humble. You see, that's God's judgment too. Raised up by His sovereign will. Verse 1, aside from the superscription, opens with the leading of the congregation in praise. We do that at Believer's Chapel. We open our ministry of the Word service with the doxology. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. And that's what is going on here in the ancient worship in Israel. The public declaration is that your name is near. Mark last week gave us a short and concise tutorial on the name of the Lord. Here, we see it is the public declaration that your name is near. That is a, a statement not so readily obvious. Uh, name in the Psalms is, is uh, a, a study unto itself. It, it, it deserves our attention, which we cannot possibly get to today. But concisely, uh, it is the person and the work of the Lord. Isn't that interesting? The very thing that we worship about Jesus Christ, His person and His work. Here are two examples. Psalm 20, verse 1. May the Lord answer you in the day of trouble. The name of the God of Jacob defends you. His person is there. And His work will be obvious. Psalm 54, verse 1, David cries out, Save me, O God, by Your name. There it is. And vindicate me by Your strength. His name is His preeminence with us, and His strength is made obvious by what takes place in the life of the believer. Uh, the person and the work of God is very much all a part of that name. So if the name is near, here's what we learn. He is near. Very near. I often say to believers, how near is the Lord to you? He's closer than your skin. The end of verse 1, wondrous works. That'd be a reference to God's creative acts as well as the disasters upon His enemies. Blessings upon His people, showering them over and over for His redemptive purpose. Let's think about that. The Red Sea saved Israel. The Red Sea crushed Pharaoh. <coughs> and His chariots. In verses 2 and 3, we now have prophetically an oracle of the disasters to come. 
We know it's an oracle because you see that word declares. The Lord declares. When you see that, you want to you want to underline it in red. Or you want to put a yellow marker over it. It is the official Word of God. He declares, I choose a set time. When is a time? When is a condition? When is an occasion? When is a providence? We think like that when we see the word when. He chooses the time. The word to choose here is actually the verb to take. Meaning that he takes possession of the set time, the set place, and the set condition. Here's the word. Genesis 1.14. The word set. Days, years, seasons. We are thankfully rolling out of summer. And I'm glad for that. And we are coming into autumn. Uh, we call that the four seasons of the year. John Calvin says it is the providence of God. It is predictable, so therefore it is a providence that is known to us naturally, not supernaturally. Uh, if it's supernatural, then we will have snowfall on July the 4th. Otherwise, it's predictable. Calvin says, think of providence. One of the things that you learn from studying the Scriptures year after year, day after day, is you, are, you see all of life coming at you in providence, in sovereignty, in these wonderful attributes of God as they are laid out for us. And here it is expressly used for a coming time of judgment. Judgment that He will bring. Joel chapter 2, blow the trumpet in Zion, sound the alarm on the holy hill. Let all who live in the land tremble, for the day of the Lord is coming, it is close at hand. The writer to the epistle to the Hebrews ends in chapter 9, verse 27. It is appointed unto man once to die, and then the judgment. So, emphatically, the Lord states, I shall judge. It is His judgment, not our own. It is a judgment of His own standard. Righteousness. Chapter 9, verse 4. You sit on your throne, and here's our word. Judging, same word, righteously. He alone sets the standard of the judgment. Any theology that starts with man is wrong. It is looking for the north star out of the south. You'll never have a good theological day because you have started at the wrong place. That's what we have here in this Word. God alone sets the standard of righteousness. We think of a a text like uh, Acts chapter 17, uh, Paul on Mars Hill speaking to the Greek philosophers, that know nothing about the revelation of God. They've never heard a Bible study in their life. And the Apostle Paul declares to them a sovereign God. And here's the way he does it. He determines the times and the places that you will live, he says. He's sovereign. He rules over all. And... If that doesn't grab you, this one will. And he said he will judge the entire world by one man, Jesus Christ. And the proof of that 
is that he was resurrected from the dead. Why, they never heard this in their entire lives. So what do we learn from that? Here's what we learn. Teach the Scriptures. Don't worry about keeping it simple. Teach them. The Word of God is powerful and it will crawl into the mind and heart of all people everywhere. Teach the Scriptures. Don't placate your audience. And so here it is. He sets the standard. Verse 3, the Lord is the source and stability of all life. The figure here is a melting away. The NIV translates it as quaking. But again, the King James is a better translation. The word is dissolved. Psalm 46, verse 6, The nations rage, the kingdoms totter. He raises His voice. The earth melts or dissolves. Same word. What is this? What is he talking about? Well, behind that statement is the figure dissolving, melting of his incommunicable attribute. What do we mean by incommunicable? We mean attributes that are not a part of our experience. We understand the jealousy of God because the human heart is jealous. We understand the fear of the Lord because we at times are fearful. But when you have an incommunicable attribute, it is something particular with God and His nature, and we don't share in it. We don't, ex we don't have that experience. We must learn about it through His written revelation. The incommunicable attribute here with this dissolving or melting is His self-existence. That's a different concept to the human experience. We all need food, air, water, shelter to survive. He needs nothing to survive. He created all of those elements for us to survive. He is totally content in His own nature. He needs nothing. We add nothing to Him. That is His self-existence. He rules. He reigns over all the creation. When He withdraws His presence, then we melt. Why? Because He is the stability for everything. Here's the way Paul Explain that back to the Greek philosophers in Acts chapter 17, verse 28. In Him we live and move and have our being. Look at this verb, to keep firm. It's the idea of setting something right, in order, in the proper place. If I were to walk in your living room and you have a lamp in the middle of your living room floor, I would say, what? are you doing that? That's out of place. We, we pick up the lamp and we put it on a table. That's the proper place for the lamp. That's what God is doing in His judgments. He is putting wickedness down and He is exalting righteousness and surprise, surprise, he's doing it every day. In some form, in some way, he is always judging righteously. That's going to help us in understanding this introduction to David. He rules, he reigns over everything. And so he's putting everything righteously back in its place. Notice it is connected to the verb, verse 3, to keep firm. The idea of setting something in its right place and order and the figure of pillars. You see that? The pillars are what we understand as 
the invisible laws, the way he set up the universe in the first place. Now, I'm always intrigued by the fact that we're not falling. Everything falls, that's gravity. But our planet, our solar system, not falling. It's in place. Ask someone to explain that to you. They can't. It's the way he set the universe up. The invisible laws like gravity, etc., the science of physics, all of that is under his direction. That's why we're not falling. We are in a place. So scientists come and they lecture us about the uniformity of the universe. That uh, everything is uniform. Example, I take a pan of water, I put it to 32 degrees in Dallas, Texas, and it freezes. I take that same pan of water down to the equator, it freezes. I take that same pan of water to the North Pole, it freezes. 32 degrees, it freezes. What if I took that pan to Venus? And your answer would be, well, I, I assume that it would freeze there. You assumed it. Why? You assumed it because the universe is uniform. It all works under the same laws and principles. My point simply is that you presuppose it. You don't have all the facts. You've never been to Venus. You've never held that pan of water. You don't know all the facts. You assume them to be so. But God knows everything. He knows all the facts. Why would I listen to anyone about presuppositions and assumptions when I can listen to His Word who knows everything? Everything. All about the universe all about you and me. So, this figure of pillar, it implies security. God allows nothing to sway, nothing to crumble in His universe. And Paul tells us that. Colossians chapter 1 and verse 17. He is before all things, and in Him all things hold together. God's sovereignty and God's self-existence. He puts it all together and He controls it. Now, verse 4. Here is His first warning of judgment to come. And this is dark and foreboding. Here is the thunder and the lightning from the throne room. To the boastful do not boast. This isn't some trivial boasting that my Dallas Cowboys are better than the Washington Redskins. No, this is something far deeper and more profound than that. This is an attitude of self-reliance, self-sufficiency, arrogance attributable to one who thinks he is better by his prosperity, by his mind, or by his whatever. Thus, by his lifestyle, he gives no glory to God whatsoever. It's not a part of his thinking. The scriptures call that wickedness. That's what the psalm calls it. Wickedness. So we have this figure of the horn. The horn implies power, authority, it is pride, it is man's self-sufficiency. And this verb to raise occurs four times in the Psalms, twice of the wicked who lift up their horn in pride, in their own self-sufficiency. 
You see it here in verse 4 and also in verse 5. It is the high horn, meaning that it is personal. And it is lifted up against the Lord. Like the Tower of Babel that was erected in the beginning, back in Genesis chapter 11. 11 verse 4. Come, let us build for ourselves a city with a tower that reaches the heavens so that we may make a name for ourselves. It's all about me. And that's what is wickedness. Self-seeking power and authority that I am somehow, some way superior to you and to everyone else. And that's wickedness. And that gives no glory to the God who created you, who puts air in your lungs every moment that you live. Notice verse 5. The possessive is your horns. The man whose life is all about him. So to speak, just listen to him. He'll tell you. He'll tell you all about himself. And when you get tired of listening, he'll ask you what you think about him. The outstretched neck is the arrogant neck. It reaches to the heavens. Such a neck can never be put under the yoke. You know what happens to the outstretched neck? It has to be snapped. It has to be broken. So, he's his own man. He makes rules for life that come from himself. Specifically, from his own heart. He doesn't need the Bible for an authority. He can tell you himself down deep in his heart what is right and wrong. And if you'll listen to him, he'll tell you. That's this man. Verse 6. This is a very difficult verse. It's rather cryptic. Uh, the very heart of the sentence, if you can imagine, is not there. So what we have to do is we have to paste and cut and wire this verse together with English terms to complete the idea. But the, the idea is very plain and simple once we do. The verse points to designated regions, east, west, desert, mountains. The idea is that God's judgment is coming and there is no place that man is safe. He owns it all. He rules it all. He is sovereign and He is the Lord of all. Verse 7, our final word for the introduction to the study. Observe the contrast, but. See that? The deliverance for what was sought in the previous verse is now contrasted for us here. The judgment that is certain to come to the outstretched neck, to the wicked, to the arrogant. And it is delivered by one. It may be General Patton and the Seventh Army, but they are just the means. The source is the Lord God Himself. He is the judge. He is the authority over all creation and everything that He has made. And His judgment is all comprehensive. And it's all correct. And no one can escape from it. Line 2 summarizes this judgment. Look at it. He brings one down... He exalts another. To bring down is one word used of humility, of defeat in the Old Testament. And thus, the defeated foe was stripped of his pride 
and thus stripped of his own self-sufficiency. But the humble, that's his judgment too. And he meets it out every day, and here it is. He exalts. The judgment of God is based upon his own will. Psalm 113, verse 7. He raises the poor from the dust. He lifts the needy from the ash heap. He sets them with princes, with the princes of His people. He will turn the world upside down. And that is His judgments. As Christ came to the temple and He saw the money changers, what did He do? He put everything in the right place. He turned those tables upside down. He whipped them out of their position in righteousness. He set things right and in order. That was His judgment for the moment. You make my Father's house a house of thieves. You've missed the point. And He turns it upside down. That's what God is doing every day. He is taking the weak and He is raising them up to make them strong. He is taking the strong and He is crushing them. But it doesn't happen just in an hour or in a moment. No, it is, you have to watch it, sliver by sliver by sliver, by sliver. That is the story of the rise of David. And that's where we're going to study. God's judgment every day upon this man. We are going to use the book of Samuel as our text. The narrative of Samuel. Our, our study starts in 1 Samuel 15, and it ends in 2 Samuel 5, when David is made king. This is a study unto itself, self-contained, the rise of David. It's a unique time. We have two men that call themselves king are recognized as kings. One is an impostor. One is the real thing. The impostor, he has the flags and the trumpets. He has the army. He has the public. The real king has no kingdom. None. And as you begin to think about it, that's us, the time that we live. We have a king, but we have no kingdom. And so the very things that are applicable to the life of David and this time that God is judging both high and low are our times. As well. What can we learn? What will we learn? We will use the Old Testament as it is determined for us to use it. The Apostle Paul, Romans 15, verse 4. Whatever things were written in the past were written for our instruction that through patience and encouragement of the Scriptures we might have hope. So, we're going to see all of our applications come in the New Testament. This then is how we should live. And this then is how we should think about our times and our places. We begin the study specifically, 1 Samuel 15, 35. The verse is a summary statement regarding the end of a relationship. The two parties are Samuel the great prophet and Saul who is the king no more. 
Samuel did not see Saul again. Samuel returning back to his town at Ramah while the king went on his way to Gibeah. This word to grieve links the 15th chapter to the 16th chapter. And later on we'll see it links into chapter 20 and verse 1. And when we arrive there, we'll actually develop a biblical theology of grief. But we'll wait till then. The king who failed at God's altar failed in his reign. So writes Bruce K. Walkey. That is a sermon unto itself. You don't recognize the Lord your God. You don't listen to Him. You don't follow His Word. And the judgment of God is upon you and it stays on you. That grieved the prophet. He had been the choice of the people. He, Samuel had sell, himself had anointed him. This man who was taller than anyone, he so much looked the part. My gosh, have you looked at this man's degrees where he was educated? Have you seen the success of this man? The fortune that he has been able to amass. Of course he needs to lead us. That's the world. It grieved. It grieved the prophet. Kent Hughes, in his Disciplines of a Godly Man, says that the godly man will demonstrate emotion before you. That's leadership. He doesn't hide it. He expresses it. I try to read every year the spectacular essay by B.B. Warfield, The Emotional Life of Our Lord. Just his emotions through life. That's a magnanimous uh, essay. But I... It brings me to Matthew 23, 37, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you who kill the prophets and stone those who sent, are sent to you. How often have I longed to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you were not willing. And I always read that with the idea that Christ has this glaze over His eyes. It pains Him. That's leadership. What do we learn? Keep close accounts with God. Your daily intake of the Word, your prayer, is essential to become all that He has for you. And that's what we're going to be looking at. That's going to be the basket that we're going to be throwing these items into. All that He has for you to become. Your power as a believer is going to come from Him alone. Let me finish up by giving you a thought. Saul is finished. Done. Stick a fork in him. There's no tomorrow for him. How do I know that with certainty? Look at 2 Samuel 15.26. Saul had rejected the word of the Lord, and the Lord had rejected him. We've studied the Proverbs enough. We now recognize parallels, don't we? Look at the parallel. Rejected the word, the Lord rejected him. Same words, parallel. Same truth. If you missed it in the top line, you caught it in line two. He's done. And yet, in the amazing and staggering providence of God, God determines that He reigns on. He's going to have the flags and the trumpets. He's going to have the army. He's going to have the government. He's going to have the power. He's going to have the authority. 
He's got the kingdom. David doesn't. How do you know? How would you know? As you begin to think about it, I have thought about it. This is what the Lord does to us. He picks us up and He drops us into a providence and we're to live with it. Through no fault of our own, nothing that we've done, this is the way that He has shaped our days and our times. Let me give you an example. Abram. God changes His name to Abraham, father of a multitude. How many children do you have? He has none. Year after year, He has none. Decade after decade, He has none. Then He has Ishmael. But Ishmael's not the, the chosen one. It's Isaac. After year after year after year, God drops him into a providence like that. Let me give you another one. Mary. Pregnant, not by men, no, by the Holy Spirit. And she has to live that way for her entire life. You know, when Christ began to gather crowds and He began to be a thorn in the side of the priests and the Pharisees, they did some research on Him from Galilee, look Him up. And so one day they boastfully come and say, we're not born of fornication. We're the children of Abraham. Where did they get that idea? They knew. It had stuck with her. Here's what you learn. Saul is necessary for David. The lack of children is necessary for Abraham. Mary being pregnant and carrying that by the power of the Holy Spirit is necessary. What's necessary about it? It creates the best version of you. It's absolutely essential to you. And specifically, think about it. With David, we have those magnanimous prayers, those awesome acts of faith, the humility of this man David, in the midst of all this oppression, all that was necessary in order for God to show us what He wants to teach us. And what is He showing you? What providence has He dropped you in? Because He's dropped you in one. And you know what? Count it all joy. It's going to be the best version of you. God is making you to be like Him. And all of this is necessary. It's all necessary. David, on the rise, a king without a kingdom. Here we go. Let's pray. Father, thank You for our study this morning. Thank You for the Word of God that teaches us over and over the manner of man and woman that we should be. Thank You, Lord, for Believer's Chapel, for the elders and the deacons that serve us here and give us this place to congregate and to hear Your Word. Speak to us in Your power with Your authority with the voice of your judgment. In Jesus' name, amen.